By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And welcome back at the Sin City Open. We are here at episode number two from this great event. And in this one, we're going to look at a match between Channel Fireball that's being played by, let me have a look here, we have Luis Dominguez who's playing this today and he is taking on JJ Liao and he's playing Dead Guy Ale. So we've got Channel Fireball, which of course is green and red, an aggressive strategy taking on the Dead Guy Ale strategy, which is white and black. So before I jump into the deck decks of both of these decks, I would just like to point out that this is an eternal central event, meaning mana burn is a thing. Fallen Empires is allowed, and we've got four strip mines in this format. So you can play up to four strip mines. If you want to know more about the rules and all the ins and outs of this tournament, please check out the description below for more information. Talking about the description below, you can also find timestamps there. For example, if you want to go straight to the MTG game, simply click on the timestamp MTG games and go to the action. And I'm going to start here now with the deck decks. I'm going to start with the channel Fireball deck from Lewis. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Louise. So this is Channel Fireball, right? Red and green. And this deck knows what it wants to do, right? It wants to get that channel out, wants to get then a Fireball or a Disintegrate and simply win the game. So Channel for the people that don't know, and you probably know, it's a restricted card. It's too green to cast Sorcery Speed and you can trade a life for a mana. So if you've got 20 life, you basically have 20 mana. But of course, then you die. So you're probably going to make it 19 mana. And then if you combine that with a Fireball, you can play a Fireball for one red, exchange your life for the points of damage you want to deal to your opponent to kill your opponent. That's basically the strategy. Now, important, of course, when you do this channel Fireball combo is that you have more life than your opponent. And that means it works perfect with the strategy of this deck. Because look at it. You've got four Lightning Bolts, three Chain Lightnings, and a lot of cheap creatures. You've got some RAM going on with the Lana where else that also can, can deal some damage themselves as well. So, I mean, it's just great. The strategy of this deck is pretty straightforward. You know, you play out your little dorks at the start. Maybe you ramp up to something bigger like an Urnum or a Granite Gargoyle. You turn them sideways and you just attack, attack, attack. Then you draw into your burn spells and you kill your opponent. If you can find a channel fireball in the process, the game gets even shorter, right? That's in a nutshell. That's what this deck wants to do. And I, I love the fact that you kept, kept it green and red because that's kind of like to the core that matches the color identity that makes sense to what this deck wants to do if you would splash a color i mean i would probably splash in just a little bit of black mana simply to give you access to a demonic tutor to find that channel but i actually love the fact that you didn't do that because i'm liking the deck much more uh you know from an aesthetic point of view as as a red green deck does that make sense Maybe I'm just rambling. If I'm rambling, ignore what I said. Anyway, um, I think the good news here for Luis is that his opponent is not playing with blue, so he doesn't have to worry about any counter magic when he plays that channel. Talking about his opponent, let's take a look at the uh, Dead Guy Ale deck. And here we see the deck of JJ. So this is Dead Guy Ale. And um, what you can really see with these decks is that you always choose one color to be more dominant. So it's going to be black or white, of course, with Dead Guy Ale. And what you usually see is that players choose to go more into the black cards for a very simple reason. The good cards in black, most of them, they have, you know, you need to have more than one swamp to cast them. I mean, look at it. Hypnotic Spectre, Sengir Vampire, Juzam Jin, they all require you to have double black. Sinkle also double black. And then you have uh, Underworld Dreams, a great card, but of course it does cost three black. So you've really got to commit into this color and that's exactly what JJ is doing. And then the white cards, the good white cards, they're kind of easy to splash, right? Because what you want to play here are the Swords to Plowshares, Disenchants and that one balance. They all have just one white in their casting cost. So they're really easy to kind of, you know, use in your deck. And I'm kind of ignoring the him to Turex here. I noticed them now on the deck photo. There are also two him to Turex in this deck. Super strong card, right? Two black for sorcery speed and your opponent has to discard two cards at random and i mean this random clause in my opinion makes it such a good card the same thing of course goes for hypnotic specter if you take damage from the specter you got to discard a card at random you know and that makes it so good these cards wouldn't be as great if your opponent could choose what they want to discard just like with the disrupting scepter for example your opponent gets to choose but with him and with the hippie your opponent cannot choose which makes it far far worse you know i'd rather have a disrupting scepter against me than Hypnotic Spectre, you know, because with the Scepter, I, I can choose what I want to do. Anyway, um, looking at the rest of the deck, and also keep in mind that uh, that he's playing against a very aggressive Channel Fireball player, 
I think that maybe the dark rituals can be really, really great for JJ. You know, I think they can be really good because they're going to help him to kind of stay up to speed with uh, with his opponent, with Channel Fireball, with Luis. And they're also maybe going to help him to kind of ramp out quickly in a game, ramp out a big creature. I mean, that's going to be a great help. I think what this for this matchup would have been really good for, for Luis is actually one drain life. I mean, for JJ, it's actually one drain life, right? Because when you play against a direct damage strategy, they usually expect every point of damage to stick and then when you have a little bit of life gain it can be really it can really change the game for you it can swing the game in your favor but uh but it's not here so we don't really have to discuss that card in length and when we're looking at the sideboard by the way i do see those circle of protection reds so they will definitely come in after the first game but before sideboarding i think the channel fireball player is a slight favorite and after sideboarding you know what, maybe maybe JJ is a slight favorite. So this is going to be a really interesting battle. Talking about that, let's go to the match. So we've got Channel Fireball versus Dead Guy Ale at round two of the Sin City Open. Game number one, here we go. So on the left, we have Luis with Channel Fireball. So that's green and red, a pretty aggressive deck here, starting with a Curd Ape turn one. If he can find a forest next turn, that Curd Ape will become a 2-3. And he's playing against JJ, and JJ is on Dead Guy Ale. And look at his opening here, a Library of Alexandria. That is great. But remember, we are playing EC, so we do have exactly, we have four strip mines, and here you can see that. So it's being stripped. At least uh, JJ can use it one more time to get a card out of it. And he takes a point of damage here from the ape, dropping to 19. So yes, he lost the library, but I mean, he got a card in return, and it was also costing a land drop for Louis, so it's not all that bad. Let's see what he can do now. Now he's got eight cards in hand, of course. So if he has, for example, a ritual, he could play ritual maybe into a hippie. That would be ideal for him. Or of course, just you know, play a play a mox. That would be great as well. But it looks like he doesn't have those cards. He's really looking at his hand, I see a Suchi there. So he's trying to decide what to discard. And he's discarding a Suchi. So I believe he then has two Suchis in hand and discarded one. There we see a bolt. Look at that. Super aggressive magic here from Luis. And that's what his deck wants to do, of course. It's not surprising at all. He's going to drop to 16. So he's already taken four points of damage. If um, Luis can find a forest now, he can put JJ on 14. That would be ideal. And maybe also play out another creature like an Argovian Pixies or something. Just put some more pressure on our Lanawar Elves. You know, that would be great. Well, let's first wait what he's going to do with his turn. I'm tapping here, drawing a card for turn. Are we going to see a forest? No, we're not going to see a forest or else he would have played it before his combat. So dealing one point of damage here. That is good news for JJ. Going to be on 15. There we see a Mox Emerald. Tapping both the Mox Emerald and the Mountain. There's the Argovian Pixie. So a card from Antiquity is a 2-1 creature. That says all damage dealt to it by artifacts is reduced to zero and it cannot be blocked by artifact creatures. So it's kind of like protection from artifacts, but it's not because, for example, you can still target it with an icy manipulator. And let's now see if, yeah, this is really important for JJ here. I want to say if he misses his land drop, it's almost kind of over already because then you're so far behind. But he's found a land drop in the form of a Mishra's factory. So he could use the factory here to block the Curd Ape. Well, I guess he can still do it. But now you no longer want to do it with that Pendlehaven there. Pendlehaven, a card from Legends. And he can give target 1-1 one, one creature plus 1 plus 2. So he can make his Curd Ape into a 2-3. And remember, uh, JJ cannot block the Argovian Pixies because it cannot be blocked by artifact creatures. So I'm expecting him here just to take the full damage exactly. Gonna drop to 11. Ooh, and just a pass here. By, uh, by Louis, so that's good news for JJ that there's not more pressure on the board. I saw Soul Ring there from the top of the deck, so if he can play out the Soul Ring, maybe find another black. Perhaps he can start casting cards like Hypnotic Spectre or Sengir Vampire. Well, Sengir Vampire wouldn't have enough mana for it, but maybe to turn after. But look at this, he's found a white source of planes. Still has that Soul Ring in hand. I believe he's got a Suchi as well, so he could play out Soul Ring, then a Suchi. There's a soul ring. Wonder what he's gonna do. Trying to kind of peek into his hand, but it's uh, hard to see. Oh, is he a balance there? Is he gonna play out the balance? The thing is here that when he does, uh, the downside for JJ is he's gonna lose some cards. But I think it's a good decision nonetheless because 
Luis is going to lose both of his creatures here to the balance. But Luis only has two cards in hand, so that means JJ has to discard three. There we, there we go. So Sinkhole, Sinkhole, and Hypnotic Spectre. But at least it kind of takes away the pressure. So that is good news here for, uh, for uh, JJ, I guess. And next turn, he can, he can cast Atsuchi, passing the turn now to, uh, to Luis. Let's see what he can do. There's a mountain. Can he play out another creature threat, tapping a red... Actually changing his mind, untapping it again, passing the turn. This is great news for JJ, you know, because every turn that the burn player isn't dealing damage, it's like it's like a little victory for him. He's on 11. If he can play a big creature threat, that would be ideal here. There's a strip mine. Could consider stripping the Pendlehaven. Two cards in hand. I wonder if he still has that Suchi. Because it kind of feels like a no-brainer to, to play it out right now. But maybe there isn't a Suchi in hand. Maybe he di it's the one he discarded. He could also, of course, first attack. Yeah, he's going to animate the factory here. And I understand this because we've seen that Luis, if he would have had a Lightning Bolt, he probably would have played it out already. So there's a small chance that he has one. So there's the attack, putting Luis on 18. Wonder what's in his what are the two cards in his hand? I guess there's no Yeah, I guess there's no switch or else he would have played it out. So maybe I made a mistake there looking at his hand. Anyway, let's see what Luis can do. Oh, that's a cool honor elves. That must have a story there with all those signatures on it. Probably comes from another tournament. There is the pass, and here we see the strip mine on the uh, Pendlehaven. I think that's a good decision. Pendlehaven is such a good card in the deck of Luis. There's another strip mine, so he could actually strip another source. Not as good, though. I think what you want here is a disenchant to to disenchant perhaps the Mox Emerald. Attacking here for two, putting him on 16 and a pass. Yeah, so there's there's no way that there's a Suchi in his hand. So I made a mistake there. I mean, or else JJ would have played it out this turn. Anyway, ooh, tapping five. What are we going to get for five? This integrate for four to the dome. That's an aggro strategy. And just purely on all the disintegrates and fireballs in the deck, you could consider using your strip just to take away a basic. You know, because it, it's going to save you one point of damage and that one point of damage can be decisive. I mean, at this moment in the game, you know, JJ has created some stability, but he's simply going too slow and he's too low on life. He's going to lose to burn. There's a disenchant. Okay, disenchanting the Mox Emerald. There's the attack for two. I think personally I would have then also stripped. I mean, it's just me. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I would have done. There's a fireball for three. Exactly. If he would have stripped it, it would have been a fireball for two. And it's, I mean, that's a difference. This is really tricky now for JJ what to do. I mean, if you attack, you open yourself up to the Llanowar Elves. And then if he has a land and a burn spell, he actually wins the game. You don't want to go down to three against these decks. Okay, he does have a Swords in hand. That changes the situation. So here's the Strip on the Mountain. There's the activation for two. I think because he has the, the Swords in hand, this is a good play. I would hear past the... Yeah, it's tempting here to also Swords main because then, you know, Luis doesn't have access to green anymore. Maybe that's a good idea. I don't know. He's not doing it though, passing the turn. I'm expecting Luis to attack for one and then we're gonna see that Swords. Yeah, there's the Swords. He's gonna gain a life from him, gonna go up to 13. There's a Chain Lightning. Yeah, you know this is gonna happen. Now you're on one. Oh, it's so close now. I mean, yes, you have control, but you're on one against the deck with all that brutality. I mean, this Hippie could be really good. But is it going to be over now? There, yeah, there's the fireball here, you see. Oh, man, yeah. So this is kind of what I expected when I looked at the deck photos, right? Like, you have, finally, you have control. You're playing your game. You're, you're, you're the boss, right? But you're so low and you're playing against Burn that you know you're probably not going to win it anymore. Anyway, this is just game one. This was super entertaining, guys. I'm going to give you some time to shuffle up and sideboard, and we'll catch back up with you in game number two.
Game number two, here we go. So we have the Dead Guy Ill player JJ on the player, starting with the Dark Ritual into an Underworld Dreams. That's a pretty nice opener. I think Dark Ritual into Hippie would have been even better against this specific deck. Although your opponent's playing with bolts and stuff. Nah, Underworld Dreams, this is a good opener. It's going to put a little bit of pressure on Luis's life total. Although Luis doesn't have a lot of card draw, but I mean, yeah, it can do something. Anyway, I mean, he's already doing something. He's going to drop to 19. Let's see what Luis can do. So the channel Fireball player, he won that first game. His deck is very explosive. Taiga into Kurt Ape, classic opener. So he's got his 2-3 Ape now. I mean, this is what Luis wants to do. Just uh, play out your Kurt Ape turn one, maybe ramp up next turn. Play out some more creatures. There is a strip line in hand there for JJ. He could consider stripping away the Taiga. That would make the Kurt Ape a 1-1 one -one again. I think that's worth considering it because and you're slowing down your opponent and you're potentially only taking one damage instead of two. There's the strip mine stripping away the Taiga and maybe you're wondering why am I seeing so many strip mines? That's because this is Eternal Central, a format where you can play with four strip mines and that means that usually you can see some more land hate and land destruction in these formats. Remember, for example, JJ is also playing with four sinkholes. So if you can combine those sinkholes with your four strip mines, I mean, they can become pretty hurtful. Anyway, let's see what Luis can do here after attacking. There's a lot of Elves. I mean, this is a great start for Luis, right? He's finding his smaller creatures, finding his lands. He's got a Kurt Ape, put some pressure on the life total of JJ. I mean, if you're JJ, what can you do here? Maybe a Swords? Okay, he's playing a Black Lotus here. Okay. Ooh, there's a Sangir. This is ideal. Wow. This is great for JJ, this turn to Sengir Vampire. And if you compare that to game one, where he was hardly finding his rituals, you know, here in game two, he's already found a ritual and a Black Lotus really helping him to kind of play his bigger creature threats early in the game. And this is really tough for green to deal with. Oh, this is cool. Um, this is an enchantment coming from the sideboard of Louis. It's life force uh, to green, and then you can counter any black spell. It's very strong, but you do need the mana. There we see another strip mine taking care of the swamp here and then attack here by the ape Ooh, why is he attacking because i think jj can just block this with the vampire yeah he's blocking it with the vampire is there some other idea i mean he's tapped out interesting choice here by uh by louis maybe it's just a mistake anyway the sangir vampire is now a 5-5 flyer it's looking really good for jj oh sinkhole taking care of the forest oh man this is a problem. Remember, uh, you know, Louise also still has that Underworld Dreams dealing damage to Louise as well. There is another Lanora Elves. Okay, at least that's something. He's finding some mana. The next turn he can, you know, use the Life Force, but yeah, that's not great. Okay, there we see a Pendlehaven. Also tapping the Pendlehaven for Scavenger Folk. Okay. So he is finding some creatures to cast. He's doing quite a lot with uh, the little amount of mana that he has. Yeah, I think he still yeah still needs to take Underworld Dreams damage. So it's going to go down to 12. Now, JJ can attack him for 5, put him on 7. I mean, I think I would do that. I mean, yes, on the swing back, Luis can deal 4 points of damage. But you're on a higher life total. And, you know, it's 5-5. Five, five. Ooh, interesting. Finding a Chaos Orb. Going to flip the orb on the land. I understand this decision. Let's see if he hits it. And yep, he hits it. A little bit messy flip, but he finds its way. That's what counts. Killing the land here. And look at the side of Luis's table. He's got no lands left. He does have some uh, mana dorks, of course. Dropping to six now because of the Underworld Dreams. I think he found a mountain. There's a mountain. This is going to be scat off for him. I mean, he can attack, you know, deal three points of damage, put him on 15, but that's not what you want to do because you're going to take five damage, you're going to go to one, and then next turn with the Underworld Dreams, you're going to die. I, I, is there really a way out here for Luis? And this is tough for him, you know. This 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 is difficult when you're playing, you know, red and, and green because you don't have access to, to for example, a Swords to Plowshares. That would really be helpful, or even an Unsummon. You don't have those cards. There's the attack for five. He's going to go to one. And I think it's the end of the road here in game number two for Luis. Drawing a card. Yep, that's it. But that means we're going to get a game number three. And I love those battles, man. I love it. So uh, let's uh, give these players some time to shuffle up. And we'll catch back with them. Uh, 
catch back to them in game number three. Game number three, the decider. This is exciting stuff. Louis on the player. Look at that. JJ taking a mulligan. So he's starting with six. Let's see what Louis can do on his opening. Wow, that is explosive. Another Curd Ape? Chain Lightning. Would have been cool to have another Curd Ape. But uh, anyway, JJ dropping to 17. If Louis can find a force next turn, he can deal even more points of damage. There is a Swamp. Can he find another Dark Ritual, perhaps? Looking at his hand here. There's a... This, so this is the Black Lotus. We saw that in Game 2. Using the Black Lotus here to cast a Sinkhole. Then he still has two Black Floating. And a him to Turek. Ooh, this is good. This is painful for Louis. Wow, that means he's only going to keep one card. Oh, man. He's going to lose. Oh, his Wheel of Fortune. That is unfortunate. That is so unfortunate. That wheel would have been a great answer to that him. And even in his deck, a wheel is fantastic because he goes so fast. Oh, man. That was such a good Black Lotus for JJ. Sinkle and him from that one Black Lotus. This was ideal for him. Let's see what he can do here. He's got a Planes in hand there. I think he also put Spirit Links in his deck from the sideboard. Makes sense. Choosing to play uh, a Mishra's Factory. There's the attack and there's the Forest. So the Curd Ape is now a 2-3. I mean, the problem for Luis is that he only has one card in hand, right? I mean, apart from that, he's doing okay. But there are far more cards there in hand by, uh, by JJ. Oh, he also has a Mind Twist. Is that a Mind Twist? I mean, if it is, I think I would just twist for one, to be honest. Or is it a Hypnotic Spectre? It's hard to see, of course. It does look like he has some options because he's kind of in the tank here trying to decide what to do. He could also choose to keep his mana open to uh, block the Curd Ape because now he can tap the Mistress Factory when he turns into a Factory Worker to pump itself. Yeah, I do think that's a Mind Twist. Ooh, choosing to play a Spirit Link instead. Wants to wait a little bit longer with the Mind Twist. Oh, and now he's playing the Twist. Of course he can do both. Taking care of that one land in the hand of Luis. Passing the turn. What can Luis do here with that one card just passing? I think there's also a him to Turek, another one in the hand of JJ. Not quite sure though, there's a scrubland and a pass turn. So an interesting moment here in the game where both players don't have that many cards anymore and kind of trying to find a solution. Yeah, I think he's now going to play to him exactly as to him to Turek. Going to use, uh, lose, I should say, a life force and a disintegrate. I mean, it's not too bad. Both players top decking mode. And I... I I think that's... Is that in, in favor of any of the players? I mean, Luis is probably going to find some more dorks and some more firepower. Ooh, yeah. Now he can take care of the uh, factory and at least deal a little bit of damage attacking here with the Lana. We're putting JJ on 13. But JJ, of course, has enough mana now to play out his bigger threats. Not finding them, though. He's got a Dark Ritual in hand, I believe. And now he found a Soul Ring. And it looks like he's going to tap 3 by changing his mind. He is... Fireball for two <laughs> to the dome. I love it. Louis is like, I'm just going to play out my direct damage on JJ. Whatever. So a lot of mana here for JJ. But the question is, what can he do with it? He really needs to find like his bigger creatures, right? Like Sengir Vampire or something. Is that a demonic tutor in hand? Ooh, that's really good. So now he's got one mana floating still. I wonder what he's going to look up. Yeah, saying your vampire, I love this play because he's got the dark ritual in hand. So he can play ritual. And then he still has one floating, so he gets three black and one and then tap another land to play it out. I like this, man. I think it's cool. There he goes. One floating, tapping a planes exactly, and then you've got enough mana. 
So there's the Sengir Vampire and the pass. This is really, really good for JJ. Also because Louis is in top decking mode. There's a pass. I mean, that Sengir is gonna, gonna hurt. It's out for blood. Louis's blood. He's on 16. Four turn clock. Finding a Whirling Dervish. Protection from black, pretty nice. Unfortunately for Louis, it doesn't fly. I believe Louis has got two, or JJ has got two cards in hand at the moment. Attacking here with the Sengir. Louis on 12. Can attack him now. Just attacking with the one. Interesting. So he probably has a play to make after this. Going to drop to nine and a counter, of course, on the Whirling Dervish. Going to become a 2-2. Two -two. Tapping three mana. Interesting. I wonder why he kept the Lanawar Elves untapped, to be honest. Could have attacked with that as well. And I mean, this this Gargoyle is actually pretty good because he can use it to Chomp Block. Probably not going to do that yet. But it's also kind of tough here for JJ because if he attacks now with the Sengir, he takes five damage on the swing back. And remember, JJ is on nine. So it's not like his life total is super high. I would be tempted here for, for JJ to just keep it untapped. Of course, I don't know what that third card in his hand is. He's got two lands. I think a Plains and a Library of Alexandria and just another card. And I mean, Louis got a lot of fuel in his deck. So when he's in top decking mode, he's very likely to find useful things. There's the attack, of course. Going to go up to a 3-3. Whirling Dervish, so protection from black. That makes it so good here. Because JJ cannot block it. And I mean, I thought JJ was in the winning seat here. But look at that. He's now on 7. There's a chain lightning on the life total here of JJ. So that means he's going to drop to 4. Next turn, he can attack him with 3 points of damage from the Dervish. Actually, next turn, if nothing changes on the board, Luis is going to win this. And he's going to win the match here. Remember, it's 1-1. One, one. This is game number 3. But I've really enjoyed these games and we're not there yet, of course. There's the attack with the Sengir Vampire. Looks like he's got another Sengir in hand. I mean, but then still, I think Luis has got this because JJ only has one blocker and he's got three creatures and Dervish is unblockable. Attack with the others as well, man. Or does he have burn? Is he gonna close it with burn? Yeah, he's got burn. Okay, fair enough. But still, I think I, yeah, if if now JJ would have had maybe a sword on his own Sengir, he could have gained some life. Anyway, it wasn't it wasn't there, but this was a really interesting game three because there were moments in the game where I really thought, okay, you know, JJ has to control, but uh, Louis managed to get back there even after that Black Lotus play uh, where he had to deal with a single and a him to Turek, all, all of that. Was that in game? That was turn one, wasn't it? Anyway, that was kind of a crazy, crazy turn one. But thank you guys for this match. It's been a lot of a lot of joy to look at it. And it's just been a lot of fun to show Magic from other places as well. So this is Magic from the Sin City Open 2023. If you want to know more about this tournament, check out the description below because there I have uh, some links to the Sin City guys. Yeah, so check it out if you're interested in that. And for now, thank you very much for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And before you go, I'd like to ask you to do a few more things. That is a like, share, and comment. These things are completely free, but really help the channel move forward. So if you like this, please take a moment to hit that thumbs up button. And if you're not a subscriber yet, please click on subscribe and ring that bell. Thank you very much for doing that. You've got my eternal gratitude. And there's one other thing that you can consider, and that is uh, you can consider becoming a Patreon of Timmy Talks, or actually a patron of Timmy Talks via patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. Please check it out. It already starts with $1 a month, and uh, you're really helping me as a content creator by supporting the channel financially. So please check it out, patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. Maybe it's something for you, maybe not. If you join though, one of the perks is that your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every single video, including this one. Let's go to the end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor?
Somebody can see.